Well, welcome, everybody. Um, and before we get started, I just want to, on behalf of uh, our panelists, to thank you for a wonderful few days. You have been incredibly hospitable, and uh, we're grateful. Um, I had the great honor of moderating this panel about the civil rights movement, and there's a, there's a quote that's in the, the book that's being distributed to all of you about the uh, Rancho Mirage Writers Festival that encapsulates, I think, the civil rights movement, and it's a good way to begin. It's from Martin Luther King, who said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. We'll talk about the civil rights movement today with uh, our illustrious panels. And before we get started, I just want to give them a, a more thorough, albeit brief, introduction. Uh, we are joined today by Lynn Olson, who is a New York Times bestselling author of eight books of history, most of which deal with, in, in some way, World War II and Britain's crucial role in that conflict. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright has called Lynn one of our era's foremost, actually make that our era's foremost chronicler <laughs> of World War II politics and diplomacy. And her work includes Citizens of London and Last Hope Island. Emily Yellen is a reporter, author, and producer, and a longtime contributor to the New York Times. She's also written for uh, Time, The Washington Post, The International Herald Tribune, and other publications. She's the author of two books, Your Call Is Not That Important to Us, How True Is That? <laughs> and uh, a session that she did uh, earlier on her, her book, uh, Our Mother's War. She, she mostly writes about the South, race, and women's issues. And Drug Brinkley is a professor of history at Rice University, CNN's presidential historian, and a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. The Chicago Tribune has dubbed, dug, dub, one of or sorry, America's new past master. He is the author of so many books, it puts authors like me to shame. In fact, by the time we end this session today, <laughs> he may well have completed <laughs> another book. Uh, among his books are Cronkite, which won the Sperber Prize and the Great Deluge, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which received the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award He's also the editor of the Reagan Diaries. So it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, Doug, I want to start with, yes, please. <laughs> Doug, I want to start with you. Like, frame for us, if you would, the civil rights movement of the post-World War II period. Where does it begin? Where does it end? And what are the milestones in between? Well, and let me say, nobody, uh, he's the only person, Mark, that knows more about Lyndon Johnson than Robert Carroll. <laughs> Truly, he does. And, uh, and George Bush and many other presidents. He's one of our best presidential historians. You. Um, you know, I teach at Rice, so when I do a class on the civil rights movement, historians, we like to bracket things a lot. And there's a lot of books now that are saying, you know, we tend to go 1954, Brown versus Topeka, uh, it's the beginning of the opening salvo of the modern civil rights movement uh, and the ending of it in 1968 when Martin Luther King Jr. is uh, assassinated in, um, in Memphis. Um, those are brackets. One could argue that the history of civil rights, when you're, you know, can pick up at any different point in World War II, uh, we're talking about Dwight Eisenhower mixing blood supplies of white and and, and African-American soldiers, or you can pick up many hot spots, but 54 is the big one uh, because once the Brown decision came in, they said the federal government was going to be against Jim Crow. You had the death of Plessy versus Ferguson, the separate but equal, and so you start seeing the disintegration slowly of, um, of, um, of ways of disenfranchising African-Americans, Latinos, and, and other uh, people from our voting process and getting an equal education. I wrote a biography of Rosa Parks, and um, you know, Mrs. Parks uh, always felt that not only was the Brown the big moment, but also the fact that her brother Sylvester had served in World War II. He was a stretcher carrier at Normandy, and then they had him move into Japan, and he came back an African American in uniform, one of a million. African Americans serving our country, and he got beaten, her brother in uniform in Alabama, and moved up to Detroit. 
And so you got a generation of World War II vets, African Americans who served, that said, what the hell, I, I fought fascism in the Pacific and Europe, and I'm coming back to Alabama and Mississippi and getting beaten, hazed, denying my votes. And so people like Medgar Evers was in the military and Hosea Williams right. and, um, and you know, uh, uh, Foreman and on and on, many of those men. Um, there's also a lot of misogyny in the civil rights movement with African-American men trying to keep African-American women underplayed, like Rosa Parks told me at the March on Washington, um, that you know nobody, they, they kind of buried the women into it. It's yeah. all men up front, which is meaning gender and civil rights is being looked at in a new way now. But from Rosa Parks, by is her big descent December 1, 1955, to integrate the buses mm -hmm. in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, when she uh, sat in a marked area that was for um, whites up front, African Americans in the back, and she accidentally sat in the wrong seat. And the bus driver, James Blake, said, move, you know, and used foul language. And she said, I prefer not to. She had been studying at um, the uh, Highlander Folk School right. in Chattanooga mm -hmm. on civil disobedience, right. the teachings of Thoreau and, uh, and, um, and Gandhi and others. And on uh, that day, she said no, and nobody could, she was like a, 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 was a leader in the African Methodist Episcopalian Church, the Freedom Church, that was part of Harriet Tubman's church and Frederick Douglass. Um, she well-dressed all the time, never cursed, never swore, and that people in Montgomery said, they put Rosa Parks in jail, how low can these people be? And she then fought it as the Supreme Court case and won. And you just start seeing after Montgomery, people challenging, um, you know, uh, the ways to erase and do away with um, Jim Crow. Uh, and by saying it's obviously part of the dramas, the era of Dr. King, I, um, all of this way through the 50s and 60s, he's the giant figure. But in Montgomery, Rosa Parks was 42 years old mm -hmm. and King was like 26. 26. Mm -hmm. right. And I asked her once, because uh, Mrs. Parks, and I said, so when did you first hear Martin Luther King talk? And she said, well, he was at the uh, Pilgrim Insurance Company and only about you know eight people showed up. We were all women from a church and he was the new preacher in town. And I said, oh, and she said, he talked to us like an hour. I said, could you, I asked the dumb question in retrospect. I said, could you see a kind of greatness about him or, you know, <laughs> which is a dumb question, but, uh, but nevertheless, I'm a little <laughs> nervous, you know, and I said, you know, I mean, I was saying, did you notice something? And she says, what he, she always said is, boy, is he cute. We, <laughs> we've got a cute new preacher in town. She said, that was all we thought about Martin back then, but they're too, they get hitched together in history in such a dramatic way. And Mrs. Parks ended up moving to Detroit to be by her brother, Sylvester. Some people call her the mother of the movement. Uh, but her, Dr. King and her were very close forever. And, uh, and she got very close to Malcolm X um, also. So uh, I think the figures that people know in school are King and Rosa Parks, but the, the number of heroes and mm -hmm of this era from, um, they're just an endless Ruby Bridges in New Orleans or James Meredith at Ole Miss and uh, John Lewis who keeps on going. Yeah. But to some degree, Doug, uh, y y there's some, a misconception about that, that famous bus ride that Rosa Parks takes. That is not, it's not chance that she's arrested. Talk a little bit about that. Um, she, uh, what really shocked her was the death of Emmett Till. A 14-year-old boy murdered in Money, Mississippi for ostensibly wolf whistling at a, uh, a white woman, a little young Emmett Till was from Chicago. He was visiting family. They beat Emmett Till. They gouged his groin out. They poked his eyes out. They tied a 75-pound cotton gin around his neck and tossed his body into the Tallahatchie River. And suddenly, um, the, to great Courage, the mother of, of um, Emmett Till, wanted the coffin open to show his mutilation and to show what white bigots did in Mississippi to her son. And Rosa Parks and others, that photo would appear in Jet mm -hmm. and other Ebony, and you know, it became in the African American community this oh my God, this is what happens to young boy, black boys that visit Mississippi. And um, that got her steamed up. And so on December 1, the driver of her bus named James Blake, 
he is a neo-Confederate kind of Nazi, really. Um, she had known he was nasty. Um, would not ride on his bus from the 1942 to 55 because he once physically grabbed her and tossed her out of a bus and called her all the name because she accidentally abs walked in the front of the bus. He used to have to walk in, put the money, walk back, and then walk around to the back of the bus. One day, she put her money in, walked to the black-colored section, but that wasn't good enough for her. He was grabbing her to go back out the door to go around. She had an altercation with him and walked home that day, so she never got on a bus that Blake was driving. But that particular December 155, after her work, she was a seamstress at Montgomery Fair department store and ironing clothes. She went to a drugstore to buy some aspirin and a Christmas gifts coming up for a couple um, relatives. And I just got on the wrong bus he was driving, and they had this kind of altercation. Uh, and she, um, she said many of the bus drivers weren't so bad. Oh, they you know, were kind of friendly, she knew. But this guy was just... Uh, bigot with a capital B. Emily, uh, Doug talked about World War II, mm -hmm. and you just did a session here at the Writers' Festival on your book, uh, Our Mother's War, and you took, told a very moving story about Lena Horne mm -hmm. as a member of the UFO. Can you mm -hmm. relate that story to the sure, audience? Sure, sure. Yeah, the, the title of my World War II book about women, uh, I have a chapter on African-American women. It's called Jane Crow. And uh, that was uh, Pauli Murray, who was a great feminist and, and civil rights activist, uh, came up with that because women had double, you know, double challenges. Um, Lena Horne was a performer with the, uh, with the USO, of course, and she was performing in Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, she was told, you'll perform tonight, and uh, you'll be in the auditorium. And then tomorrow morning, you'll perform in the mess hall, because the African-American soldiers aren't allowed in the auditorium on the, on the base. Um, so she said, and this goes to Rosa Parks and what you said about the bus, she said, one of the problems with segregation, it was so inconvenient. And so she had to get up at 8 in the morning, so she did it. And she looks out at the audience before her performance in the mess hall at 8 a.m. And she notices that the black soldiers are there, but the three rows in the very front are white soldiers, or white, white men. And she said, what's that? And said, oh, that's the German POWs. And she thought, she didn't perform. She said, I can't do this. And she walked out and she marched over to the NAACP office in Kansas, in Fort Riley, and met Daisy Bates, who was one of the leaders in the uh, Little Rock School integration. And from then on, she had enough money and enough power. She quit the USO and she did her own tours and insisted they be integrated. So that was one of those small moments, but it was pretty huge. <laughs> the, the civil rights movement is very personal to you. Your parents moved from New York City to Memphis, Tennessee, your hometown, in order to get involved in the movement. They were on the front lines of the civil rights movement. Uh, talk about the civil rights movement from your personal perspective. Okay. Yes, we lived in New York City. All of us were born. My brother Doug is here, one of my favorite Dougs. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, in 1964, my father moved to Memphis to start the film and television department at Memphis State University. And um, their friends in New York said, Memphis, that's kind of like joining the Peace Corps, but you don't have to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it turns out, uh, they, they arrived, and it was three, we arrived, it was three weeks after Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were found, and we're half Jewish, and when we were at a gas station, my mother tells the story, I was very young, so I don't remember, but we were at a gas station before we went to our new home, and we had New York plates, and she, my mother was being very friendly and said, oh, you know, we've moved here from New York, and the gas station attendant said, you better get rid of them New York plates. <laughs> and so that was the start. That was our welcome to Memphis, <laughs> 1964. Yeah, August 1964. And, um, Which then, is a seminal time, the, yeah. the, the very month that the, or, or the month before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mm -hmm, yeah. was signed, breaking the back of mm -hmm. Jim Crow. And my mother was quoted um, in our family as saying uh, she wanted to be there when the South woke up. She had grown up in Oklahoma, so she had known Jim Crow growing up. So we were. Um, I don't know if it's woken up yet, though. Um, but uh, we lived there, and in 1968, my brother, Doug, who's right here, was 11. I was six, 
and we were watching television. It was six o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday, and all of a sudden, about five after, I got used to this growing up as a kid in the 60s, um, a special bulletin comes on and says, Martin Luther King has been shot downtown. And my brother Doug yells to my father, Dad, Martin Luther King was shot. And my, my other brother had been outside in the car, washing the car or something, and he had the radio on. And he comes running in and he says, Martin Luther King was shot. And then our housekeeper, because at the time, everyone had an African-American housekeeper. We were taught not to call her a maid. That was our biggest concession. Um, and she called. And I answered on the other phone. And I heard her screaming into the phone, Miss Yellen, they shot Dr. King. So I went up to my father and I said, Dad, who is Martin Luther King? And by this time he had died and he looked at me and he said, he was a great man, Emily. And so they often say that the civil rights movement ended in 1968. And for me, that's when it began, mm. really. Mm. And growing up with that, I was in school with James Lawson's son and he was one of the uh, leaders of the sanitation strike, which is why Martin Luther King was in town. And I was in first grade with him and in our class, they handed out a weekly reader. Does everybody remember the weekly reader? Mm -hmm. <laughs> weekly a, lot of, a lot of audiences don't you know, <laughs> these days. Um, and uh, they handed out the weekly reader. His picture was on the front. And apparently, some of the students drew horns on, on him. Mm -hmm. wow. Because uh, I went to a school that was mostly white, but some of the black ministers, leaders of the civil rights movement in Memphis, kids went there. And um, the teacher took him up and said, I couldn't send them home that way. So that was kind of the beginning, and then you want me to keep going? Well, uh, let me get back to that. Okay. And we'll come back to, to sure. 1968 in a moment. I, I referenced earlier Lynn's books on World War II, uh, which she's spoken about at the conference. She, she's also wrote, written a, a marvelous book on the role of women in the civil rights movement called Freedom's Daughters. Uh, and women book. are often overlooked in the civil uh, rights movement. Talk about the role that women play. Oh, the women, women led the movement in a way. I mean, they organized it. Um, Freedom's Daughters is, is, starts even before the time Doug is talking about. It starts really in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and goes you know, basically to the 60s. Um, we've been talking about Rosa Parks. Um, actually, that Rosa Parks was, was, is the preeminent figure in, in what happened in Montgomery. But it was women who who organized that, a group of professional black women, African-American women in Montgomery were looking for a woman like Rosa Parks mm. to have that encounter on a bus. They were planning for months to have that happen. Not necessarily that Rosa Parks, in fact, there were two other young women who, who were also uh, basically thrown off the bus or told to go to the back of the bus. Um, but their, their uh, stories weren't what they wanted. They wanted somebody like Rosa Parks. And it was this group of women who were planning this. So once they found out, it was this, you know, what Doug was talking about, oh my God, Rosa Parks has been arrested. And these women were jumping up and down with joy. I mean, they didn't want her to, she, she, she was not in prison. She was booked and then uh, released. And virtually from the moment they learned about that, they put into motion their plan for a boycott. That boycott had been planned for months, if not years. And within a couple of days, they had no idea if it was going to work. Because these were uh, well-educated, uh, professional women. And they had no idea if the maids and the cooks and the ones who really rode those buses, these women didn't, they had their own cars. But the, the, the people that really rode, rode those buses, basically women, if they would go along with it. And I talked to a number of the women who were still alive when I was doing research for the book who had arranged this boycott, had worked on this boycott. And they woke up Monday morning after Rosa Parks' um, arrest, you know, with kind of fear in their hearts. That, 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 and they looked out and they walked the streets and nobody was rising, riding the buses. And they continued that way for months and months and months. And this took great courage on the part of these women because they had to go to their jobs and they were walking. Mm. Um, they were walking sometimes nine, 10 miles each way to get to their jobs, but they continued doing it. And so the story, and, and my, my book is really about how women were 
uh, the engine of the movement. There's mm -hmm. no question. If, if women had not been involved, the movement would not have succeeded the way it did um, in terms of um, what was accomplished. I mean, Martin Luther King is absolutely um, the major figure of the movement, but if he had not had those women, <coughs> I mean, he was in front. He was always in front. The male ministers were always in front, but it was the women who were really organizing and really doing the work. And in virtually every town, city, wherever, from Albany, Georgia, to, um, to Atlanta, to, to Mississippi and Alabama, you know, it, it was grandmothers. It was, it was the women, the women who were out there risking their lives as well as the men. And there was a reason for that. Women could get away with more than black men. I mean, black men always were at terrible risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but they, they never got the credit. And they never really sought the credit, uh, most of them. They were, they were content to have the men out in front. But uh, Doug can speak to this more than I can, better than I can. But I, Rosa Parks, I think, did resent the fact that she, that she was a symbol. Right. Um, but she was more right. than a symbol. She had been an activist, a civil rights activist, for all of her life. Um, and secretary for the NAACP, right? I mean, yeah, she, right. she was secretary right. of the local NAACP. Right. She was really important. And, and the idea that, that she was a tired old seamstress who just didn't want to get up from the seat is crazy. Right. I mean, she wasn't yeah. old for one thing. And she, and she said, I was tired, but no more tired than I was every other day. Yeah. Um, or and, else. Um, and so, uh, I'll just close on this. I, I interviewed Stokely Carmichael just before he died, and um, I asked him about the role of women. And he basically said, he, he said, women were the movement. He said, without women, Stokely Carmichael obviously started with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was a, a, a major figure. And he said, we had a saying in SNCC that if you want to get the, um, I can't remember exactly, if you, you if you want to get the men, you have to have the women, because the women were always out in front. They were always doing the work that was necessary to make that movement um, accomplish what it accomplished. But, but while uh, Rosa Parks resented that depiction of her, it was also very concerted. It was part of the message uh, to have this tired old seamstress on the bus getting yanked out by this, this racist bus driver. That was part of what awakened America yeah, the struggle. No, right? that's, so, right. that's right. If they had said this was a, you know, a long time civil rights activist, it certainly would not have gotten, the, right. it wouldn't have resonated right. the way right. it did um, throughout white America. Um, right. But at the same time, it also you know, leads to the um, kind of disappearance of her in a way. Right, right. Uh, you know, that she was an activist. She, wa it, 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 she wasn't you know, a, a passive person. She was a very, very active civil rights person. This was yeah. not accidental. It was by not means. accidental right. by right. any means, right. no. Doug, what is the greatest misconception about the civil rights movement? Well, some of the, what we're talking about, one thing I want to agree with all of that. Uh, one of the things that we, there are, were white liberals in the South, yeah. uh, like Virginia Durr. Mm -hmm who was in um, Montgomery, who helped Rosa Parks, paid her fare to study disobedience. And Alabama became a great proving ground because of the federal judges. A judge, a Republic, some Eisenhower Republican judges, Judge Frank Johnson was appointed in Alabama. So you had one, let's just say, for a suprem white supremacist kind of judge. You had one that was a FDR New Dealer liberal, and Ike's Republican judge started voting federal courts for all civil rights in Alabama, so Dr. King could stage a lot of stuff in Alabama. But the reason the bus boycott worked in Montgomery was the company was owned by a Chicago company, and they had integrated buses in Chicago. And as you said, when they stopped riding, when the women stopped going on the buses, they became empty. Uh, and so if you're up in Chicago, anybody here was in business, it's going on for a year and nobody's riding your business buses when you have integration in Chicago, but not in Montgomery. It became a perfect laboratory, Montgomery. And it was also not too large. You could walk hard, but you can walk. It's not Atlanta, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and then, um, and so I think the um, other one is 
a misperception, or you, you t were touching on, but like something like Claudette Colvin mm -hmm. yes, in Montgomery, exactly. right, she right, got, right. before Rosa Parks, just like she was saying, they were looking to implement Brown and integrate the buses, and you had Third Good Marshall up in Baltimore, D.C., and all this. A young woman, Claudette Colvin, had her moment, civil disobedience, went on the bus, an African-American woman, but she didn't get vetted because she cursed Right. They found out she was pregnant and not married, and they didn't think she was the right symbolic, symbolic. woman yeah, that's right. Right. to that's put right. forward. That's and right. so she kind of fizzled, and there was a stage. Rosa Parks was perfect. The sad part for me, guys, was I spent a lot of time with Mrs. Parks. She had me take her to get her congressional gold medal um, in Washington. I would be with her in Detroit. I went to church with her. Um, and the... Uh, sad part was when she moved to Detroit, she was broke. Just because you're famous doesn't mean you have money. Mm. And she worked in a rag mm. factory making towels in a factory in 62 while she was going for free for the NAACP. And she had a supportive spouse named, um, um, and her spouse, she always would tell me, don't forget Raymond, because it was unusual for a man to let his woman be a kind of actress where he kind of stayed at home. And, it was a re, re, and they never had children. Rose Parks couldn't have children, but she loved children. End of her life, and I'll stop and get off of her, but end of her life, um, she became Buddhist. Um, she went over to Japan and adopted Buddhism mixed with her intense Christianity, her love of the AMA church and Buddhism. She was a very spiritually sound person um, and kind, very kind. Uh, when you write about her, some... Some of you might say, well, what's, tell me the dark, mean side about her. She just was a very religious, you know, some people uh, don't want to make her a saint. But, um, but yet, what you touched on, she was an activist for a long time, uh, doing cases of women raped in mm -hmm. Alabama. And she once told me, I'm gonna, I've got to give them more mic time here, but she, <laughs> she um, once told me that, so she went down to my, uh, Birmingham, and she was in the audience, like sitting right here like you are, when Dr. King was speaking, and a white supremacist came up and punched King in the face. And they started grabbing him. And, um, they, and he was angry because Sammy Davis Jr., the black actor, was dating a white woman. Hmm. And, he, and that's why he punched King. And King did this dramatic, nonviolent thing. Let him alone. Let him alone. Uh, well, how are you? Why did you do that? You know, this whole, like, talk down therapy. And he didn't want the police doing arrest charges against the guy. And Rosa Parks gave him a Coke and put ice and aspirin mm -hmm. on his face in the back. And I said, well, what did you think about all that? And she goes, oh, I just couldn't believe Martin. And I said, not the other guy. So she goes, he really believed that nonviolent stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Mrs. Pro, I said, well, what would you have done? She goes, if somebody punched me in the face, I'd punch him back in the face. Uh, you know, so she had that feisty part of her, yeah. too, even though she, you know, and people don't realize that about her. But. Emily, you talked about Martin Luther King's assassination on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis on the, the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. We all know that that famous image of, of Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson and others pointing at the assassin in the distance. Um, but, but Martin Luther King, we associate him, of course, with the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But by that time in his life, his crusade had broadened. Mm -hmm. Talk about the evolution of Martin Luther King. Yeah, well, I'm by no means a Martin Luther King scholar or anything else, but living in Memphis, you learn about Martin Luther King and you learn about Elvis. So I'm going to talk about Martin Luther King. <laughs> um, um, we'll come back next year and talk about yeah. Elvis. Yeah. Her next uh, book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what I do know, though, is he was really very involved at that time in the Poor People's March, and the whole idea of poverty and economic justice was huge. He was also very opposed to the Vietnam War. And he had spoken out a year before he was assassinated, almost exactly a year before, spoken out against the Vietnam War. And you know, it's really ironic to see, you know, this is a room full of white people, almost all of us. And um, when the memes come out on Martin Luther King Day and you see people who you know have some racial issues quoting Martin Luther King, but what they don't quote are a lot of the things he said that were much more revolutionary. Yeah. And at the time, he was, thought of as a communist, he was thought of as all these things. But I think the really um, big lesson that I like to say about it is that he died defending sanitation workers. 
that's what he was doing. And he wasn't just there for a rally. He was there. These men were, um, there were 1,300 men. I'll, I'll go ahead with it. I, I just did a series where I interviewed all of these surviving sanitation workers and their wives and their children because I wanted to make sure that their w wives were counted as well. And there were 1,300 Memphis sanitation workers who were just working in horrible conditions. And two of them were killed in February 1968 because they came to work, it was raining. They aren't issued any kind of rain gear, so they had their own raincoats. And two of the men ride in the truck and two on the back of the truck. And it was raining, and so they had to work because if they didn't work, they didn't get paid. And it was the end of the shift, and they, two of them stepped inside the barrel to, to oh shelter themselves from the rain, and something malfunctioned, and they were both crushed. <laughs> and um, the city of Memphis uh, gave them $500, their families. Um, and, and so that was the beginning, and that was when uh, the, the men were gonna go on strike, but they were gonna wait till the summer, because that's a better time to have a sanitation strike. In the middle of winter, it's not quite as bad, especially in Memphis in the summer, it's hot. So, but they couldn't wait. And the National Union was gonna try and co-opt that, but they said, no, nope, we're gonna do this, and they did it. And it was a 65-day strike, and Martin Luther King was one day mm -hmm. he came uh, he, came, he came and spoke once, and then he came and marched. And the march was turned around because the, they say it was a riot, but it was police violence. Mm -hmm. And police violence is an issue today, mm -hmm. and it was an issue then, police brutality. And it was turned around. And so he was pilloried. They, there was a headline in the newspaper that said, Chicken a la King, uh -huh. in the Memphis newspaper, because he was pilloried for turning it around. But he had to come back. He didn't want to. But he had to come back. That was in March, March 28th. So in March, uh, in a on April uh, 3rd, he came back to Memphis, and he made the famous mountaintop speech. And that speech, I actually listened to it this morning mm -hmm. again. He talks about economic equality. He mm -hmm. talks about um, police brutality. He talks about all of the things that he felt the movement needed to keep addressing. And he was planning his Poor People's March, and he felt that this was the same kind of campaign as in Montgomery. And he felt this was a real, really important thing for him to join. And so he did, and he made that speech, and then the next day on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, he was shot. And the man who shot him, I, I, I do believe shot him, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, James Earl Ray. And his, his family was connected to white supremacists all throughout the South. So, in, in talking to the sanitation workers mm -hmm. still alive and their families, you are continuing the work of your parents. Yes. Your parents had the foresight yes. between 1968, after Dr. King's assassination, and 1971 to interview those same people. What do you derive from those oral histories? Well, what was amazing is most oral histories, particularly of the civil rights movement, were done 30 years later. And um, Taylor Branch, <coughs> a great civil rights historian, said that Memphis's role is one of the best documented in the country because of, I, I say, because of the work my parents did. I think Doug and I say that. Um, and, and what they did, my father was head of the television and film department, my mother was an editor at Reader's Digest, and they set out five days after the strike. They had a meeting in our living room, and I was there, and um, they uh, interviewed 150 people involved in the sanitation strike. And the, the joke in our family, the mayor at the time, Mayor Loeb, was an awful white supremacist, and just a, not a good guy, and a lot of people blame him because he's the reason they went on strike, all of that. So we used to say they interviewed everybody from Mayor Loeb on up. <laughs> and, um, and so they did that, and then my father had the foresight to go to the TV stations, which had all done uh, film at the time, it was film, of the strike, and so there's 24 hours of film that he saved and preserved. So I grew up with this, and um, 30 years later, can I go there? Please. Um, I end up, or, 20 some years later, I end up reporting for the New York Times. And I've reported all over the South. And much of what I was reporting, the, the bureau chief at the New York Times at the time, Kevin Sack, said to me, when you're reporting on the South for the New York Times, you're reporting on race and change. And this was in the 90s and mm. 2000s. And a lot, I did, the biggest story I did was on the unsolved uh, murders from the civil rights movement. And Doug Jones was one of the leaders of uh, 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 prosecutors across the South who were bringing those cases up again and getting convictions. And so um, that, you know, is a continuation. And I think anybody who was alive in the South at that time who has a conscience 
um, I, I would hope, has some sense that this fight continues. Lynn, uh, the success of the civil rights movement galvanized other movements. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the seminality of the civil rights movement? I mean, the civil rights movement was a seedbed of virtually every major movement since then. Um, the women's movement. The women's movement uh, grew in the, of the 60s grew out directly from the civil rights movement. Two of the, the top white women, young women who were involved at SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, Casey Hayden and Mary King, wrote this, this, uh, this great statement about women and, and how we should turn in what we did, use what we did in the civil rights movement and start a women's movement. And it, as I said, they were two of the first leaders of the women's movement, the feminist movement. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the anti-war movement uh, uh, grew out of the civil rights movement. The, the civil rights movement is is so seminal in protest in nonviolent that they, they, they I mean they took what Gandhi did and, and, and used nonviolent protest but but they 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 really the civil rights movement is really the foundation uh, for the protest movements that we have today mm. um, you know they're, they're really drawing on uh, what happened in the 50s and 60s I and mean, we haven't had time to go into the student movement uh, of the civil rights movement but it was extraordinarily important mm -hmm. um, and so uh, every day um, we, well, we all are the descendants of what happened uh, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, and, and, and early 70s. It was just extraordinarily important. The, the, um, it, it talk, talk a little bit about the, the uh, women's movement and why, what uh, the most important lessons that the women's movement derives from the civil rights movement. Well, I, what we really haven't had time to talk about are the complex, and Doug re uh, referred to the, the complexities of the gender of, of women and men right. in the civil rights movement. Right. It was incredibly complex because you're dealing with the relationships not only between African American women and African American men, you're dealing with uh, black men, white women, uh, and there were a lot of whites. It, Doug said, uh, in the civil rights movement, particularly young white students. Freedom Summer in 1964, uh, 64, right, yeah. Um, a whole bunch of white college students went down to the South to work in, in voter registration, et cetera. Um, and sex and gender is incredibly intertwined. Um, you know, a white woman pure, it goes back to, to the South, you know. Uh, in early days, white woman pure, uh, undersexed, black mm. women oversexed. Um, so there were all these, these uh, shibboleths about women, white women put on pedestals with black women down there. Mm -hmm. And so it continued, that, that kind of um, intertwining, um, and it, it, pr it was proved to be, it complicated the civil rights movement, to put it mildly. And so the women in the civil rights movement, the white women are the ones who led the women's movement. It wasn't the black, the black women weren't really welcomed that right, much. Right. Again, it was white women taking what they had learned from the civil rights movement, that, that, that they were powerless, uh, just like blacks, and using what they had learned in the civil rights movement to take it and put it into the women's movement. But most black women felt left out and, uh, of that. Um, so, uh, and I write a, a lot about this in, in my book, um, and, and those complexities still are around. Right, I mean, right. one thing I think all three of us would say is civil rights movement it was extraordinarily successful in so many ways, but it never solved the problems. The problems are still there. We're dealing with deeply held cultural values in this country that we've made progress on, but the fight continues. I mean, I so to that question. end, and this is a question for all of you, what is the state of the movement today? Well, you know, there, uh, just to build on your last comment, there are a lot of things that have come out of the civil rights movement that have kind of tendrils that have shot out. One is environmental justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about garbage worker strikes of Dr. King. It's a flash moment of beginning of environmental justice. And out here in California with Cesar Chavez, who's from Yuma, Arizona, by his campaign to, um, you know, um, get with pesticides and public health in the fields and all of this. And how often 
I think um, still poor neighborhoods, Latino, Latinos and African Americans get uh, toxic waste put in their neighborhoods and sites. And you know, all of our, we put it where poor people are. And then the statistics of people with cancer, are, you know, things like the Flint water crisis scenarios are very quite profound. And I think there's a need for a literature to look at the atomic test and the downwind in Nevada and just environmental uh, degradation of people of poverty and of lower um, class incomes. And it's sort of a, a side environmental justice now with climate change here and how that's gonna disproportionately and terribly affect people in a lower strata of the economic um, sphere. But otherwise, I think we see Black Lives Matters coming up, and, right. and uh, Spike Lee is nominated for an Oscar right now for his incredible Black movie. Lives. And uh, there are people like Stokely Carmichael are being looked at in, in a new light. Women in the civil rights movement's a gigantic new scholarly topic. Um, certainly, we have African American mayors, politicians, who in the 60s, no, you know, the dream would have been Barack Obama someday. David Remnick of The New Yorker wrote a book, The Bridge, you know, of, of Edmund Pettus Bridge and Selma, from John Lewis and Selma to Barack Obama in the White House. But now we're in this post-Obama uh, post, um, era, mm -hmm. and we see the rise of anti-Semitism and racism and xenophobia. Misogyny. And misogyny, <laughs> bigotry. <laughs> And, um, and we're feeling like, oh my God, we gotta go uh, start a whole new movement right now. And that's what I think the Democratic left is trying to do is pick up where the civil rights activism of the 60s, uh, we were just talking about Memphis, Bur Montgomery, Birmingham, but we could talk about the Latinos, you know, the, the brown power yeah. movement of that era too. And, you know, right. and Native Americans at Wounded Knee and last Cesar Sunday's, Chavez. yeah, Chavez and last Sunday's New York Times was about Native American, a whole, you know, the D Brown buried my heart at Wounded mm -hmm. Knee starting to be reanalyzed. Uh, and the native story is starting to come in more mm -hmm. powerfully and also academically, it's a very right time for gender and race and understanding but in society at large, I'm afraid we're in a very uh, um, almost neo-fascist kind of feel in the country right now that's quite, quite frightening. We've but, got, yeah, yeah, please. I just, just very quickly, but the, the, the heartening thing is the resistance, I mean, yeah. you know, which right. is basically what the activism that has bubbled up, and we've seen it in the election um, last year, um, that, that is exciting. That is exciting because it what, is. Yeah. People are taking no. the country back. Oh, right. there, there are movements to take things back. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, another piece is criminal justice and, and, yeah. and reform. Right. And Brian Stevenson's great book, right. uh, Just Mercy. Just Mercy, yeah. where uh, you know, really relooking at lynchings and these sorts of things and how that still is playing out and the way that uh, institutions have encoded racism into our world. You know, and really, I see living in Memphis, millennial black. Uh, activists really doing amazing things and in this summer I just wanted to say this summer in Memphis this is not by any means a solution but it's 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 to me what's hopeful is a number of young black women millennials uh, were elected 20 black women were elected to state city and county government in Memphis this summer and they've already started to change things and one of them was the, the juvenile court uh, would charge the kids to call their parents so they couldn't call their parents and she changed that one of the city the councilman and so it's 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 I think what's happening is the state and local governments are starting to foster this and in 10 years those people are going to be running for national office as well so I think it's a it's a good thing at least in politics <laughs> if uh, not in addressing poverty <laughs> Lynn we have just a, a little over a minute left uh, I want to end where uh, one of the discussions on uh, Wednesday night began, and that was uh, about Confederate statues oh. uh, and their removal, the controversy over their removal. Right. What, in your view, should we do about those oh statues depicting Confederate statues? I, I, will, defer, yeah. I will defer to my, uh, my colleagues who, who probably have more stronger opinions on right, it well, than I, I do. You go ahead, you I, go. So I wrote about Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, who is in Memphis, and it was right after the Charleston uh, shooting, and uh, the city council 
uh, voted to uh, take it down. It's a huge statue of him, and his, it's, it's in the middle of a city, a mile from where Martin Luther King was killed, 65% black city. And uh, the Tennessee legislature made a, a retroactive law that you couldn't take down Confederate statues. Long story short, they followed New Orleans' example in the middle of the night <laughs> la in December of 27. They took it down. And everybody was amazed. And I, I, I understand the argument that it's history and you need to keep it up, mm -hmm. but to me, living where I live, it's a constant reminder of hate, and it's, you know, you don't see statues of Hitler in Germany. <laughs> and so that's the way, as I understand it, I certainly don't speak for African Americans, but as I understand it, that's the experience they have every time they see that. And I think we have to take that very seriously and not diminish it, not call it political correctness, not say you're revising history or rewriting history. Those statues were put up to rewrite history. In the, in the mm -hmm. turn of the century, uh, the Daughters of the Confederacy erected right. those statues all over the South, at least, to change the view of the Civil War and make the losers into the heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, please well join said. me in thanking right. Thank Lynn Olson, you. Emily Allen, and Doug Brinkley. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.